Hello, and you're very welcome to episode four of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Tottenham, Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. And Mark, as you know, we made a plaintive cry at the end of the last show to our listeners to share our podcast. And then when they'd finished sharing, to share it a little bit more. Isn't that what we did? That's it exactly seems it. to be getting a little bit of traction because there was a there was a chart entry during the week. The 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 chartable website seems to think that we are the number three business show in um, in Ireland, and I wasn't even aware we were a business I show. Think there's great substance behind the, that research. We we <laughs> believe that that is the case, do we? Indeed. <laughs> well, we're going to take it. We're going to take it. So thank you to everybody who has shared and has tuned in because we did we did feature at number three on the list, whatever that means. Exactly. But uh, you know, says you, that's good news rather than bad news. Okay, on last week's show, you may remember we talked at length to senior counsel Simon Mills. And as we know, Simon is one of our leading experts on medical negligence law. Mark, we got a great response to that, didn't we? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, he was very interesting. No, really good. Really good. Well, this week we're focusing on family law and we're delighted to have in studio leading family law solicitor and senior counsel Keith Walsh of Keith Walsh Solicitors based in Crumlin. And we're going to discuss all matters family law with him. But first, Mark, as always, you have identified three very interesting cases from the Decisis website. The first is called KC versus BioAtlantis Aquamarine Limited, if I can say it. It's a court of appeal decision from Mr. Justice Noonan, and it concerns the entitlement to the fruits of the land, and in particular, in this case, very curious, seaweed, the The, right to get some seaweed. The fruits of the sea, exactly. The fruits of the sea, I suppose, yes. And the case was, in fact, brought under the planning legislation, um, under Section 160 of the Planning and Development Act 2000. You can look for what's called a planning injunction, which is where you ask the court to to grant an injunction to stop certain works being carried out. What happened here was that the state, uh, under a a different body of the state, had granted what's called a foreshore license to the defendant to harvest wild kelp, which is a type of seaweed, and I think these kind of licenses are getting more common. And I <clears throat> certainly I'm aware that there's a lot more sort of shellfish farming and other kind of commercial activities yes. happening where, where offshore was in the this West Island. Part of the coast? This is Bantry Bay. Bantry Bay, okay. So, so this is a, a, a license was granted to this company, Bio Atlantic Aquamarine, to to harvest seaweed in a num- quite a wide, a large part of Bantry Bay. Um, and the the applicant in this case, who I think was a, a concerned citizen. Um, made it made this application of the planning in, uh, legislation effectively saying, even if you have your license, do you have planning permission to do what you want to do? And the judge said that uh, you do. Isn't the, that effectively what he said? The judge said in this case was, in any event, the activity in question does not involve an alteration or a change to the seabed itself, but rather something attached to and growing above the seabed. In that regard, I agree with the analogy drawn by the trial judge that harvest, harvesting seaweed is akin to cutting flowers on land. So he effectively, he said, uh, guess, harvesting could, seaweed... I could see like, a Ming the Merciless or somebody emerging in Bantry to kind of lead locals. To, exactly. You can't interfere with our right to gather seaweed. Exactly. That, that, and, would, that would be then, absolutely terrible. And then the second issue was the fact that because it was happening offshore, it didn't touch the the jurisdiction of the planning planning authority Authority. in County Cork. Yes, of course, which would be Cork County Mm. Council. Okay, very good. Now, on to our second decision today, and this is in the area of financial law, and it comes from the High Court. Uh, And this is a case called Hiscox SA versus the Financial Services and Pensions Ombudsman. Uh, It's a decision of Mr. Justice Burns, and he dismissed an appeal against a decision of the Financial Services Ombudsman. And this concerned... Uh, an insurance company which had refused to cover a play centre area uh, at the outside of the COVID-19 pandemic. Exactly. So what happened here was that, uh, while you say it's a financial issue, it certainly is a financial issue, but it touched on a a, a play centre. And at the outset of COVID, obviously, there were recommendations that everybody stop their commercial activities. And what happened here was that as soon as the recommendation came from the HSE to to, to the childcare sector, this, this organisation closed it, closed itself. Um, they then made an application to their insurer for business interruption cover, and that was refused. And the refusal was based on the fact that this was a recommendation from the HSE, that it hadn't been a direction from the HSC. They hadn't closed it down. They'd simply recommended that it be closed down. Now, in fact, the insurer in this case, it should be said, backed down fairly quickly. But the suggestion from the FSPO, the Financial Services and Pensions Ombudsman, that the decision was unreasonable, unjust and otherwise improper. 
that. So when did they back down? This, so they took the appeal, though. The insurance company took the appeal. The, the, the insurance company, in fact, had, I think by the time of this appeal, had uh, had agreed to cover the the centre, but they hadn't said that the refusal had been necessarily wrong. They okay. basically acknowledged that, that they were entitled to cover, but they were that they had been entitled to question it. And effectively, that the... the the, the the FSPO said no, really. In these circumstances, they should have just paid up. And Mr. Justice Byrne said they got it right. Exactly. Okay. Finally, the, the last case, and this is a decision from the High Court again. This is Ms. Justice Phelan, uh, and this case is called McGrath and the Health Service Executive, and it concerns mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse. Always, a, obviously, a very serious issue. Uh, the judge found that there is an obligation and duty. In this case, it was the HSE to report the abuse to Tusla, even in circumstances where the victim, in this case, was now an adult. Yeah, so th- this is, a, I can see this is going to be a very controversial area because the mandatory reporting, the purpose of mandatory reporting is clearly to protect children. That that if a, a counsellor is dealing with a child and the child reports something that gives rise to a belief on the part of the counsellor that, that, that there is a sexual abuse ongoing, then they are obliged to report it. They don't, the, 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 kind of, the ordinary kind of client privilege no longer applies. The counsellor who raised the issue in this case was dealing with adult victims of, of sexual abuse, but, but abuse from when they were children. And the question was, do they still have to report that? I mean, if, for example, no, the, the adult, is, yeah, if the adult has adult. said, I don't want to report it, I'm talking to you about it because of my own, you know, because of my own personal issues, but I, you know, there may be reasons why the the, the adult d- doesn't want the yes. child sexual report, uh, abuse to be reported. And what the court said was having lo- had a look at the overall tenor of the legislation and the specific wording that simply the fact that there is child sexual abuse reported means that that does need to be reported on to Tuzla, that once the counsellor is aware of the child sexual abuse, it then has to be reported on. And is that just as a matter of record or is it for Tuzla then to get involved? Well, I think it's then for a matter for Tuzla to decide how they're going what to they're deal going to with the situation. Stage. Okay, Mark, thank you for those three really interesting cases. Uh, and we're going to be back shortly with Solicitor Keith Walsh. Silence in the fifth court. Okay, so we're delighted to be joined in the studio today by Keith Walsh. Uh, Keith is a very well-known solicitor. He qualified in 2001 and he's also now one of the early solicitor senior counsels. Were you one of the first batch of senior counsel? Uh, Second batch, actually. Second batch, I see, okay. Um, uh, Member of the Council of the Law Society, uh, former president of the Dublin Solicitors Bar Association and a well-known practitioner in family law, uh, which is the area we'd like to talk about today. And I suppose one of the things that certainly non-family lawyers might think is there's a certain amount of mystery about family law because of the fact that it is all held in camera. Now, the rules changed a little bit to allow journalists into family courtrooms. Isn't that right? It, yeah, it is. The um, the court uh, court officers, or sorry, the Courts Act uh, was changed, Article or Section 40 of it, uh, to allow... Uh, bona fide reporters and members of the press as well as solicitors and barristers or academics to come in and to report on cases. That's good up to a point but what you really need to do is to allow access to the actual files for we'll say more empirical type studies and one of the difficulties in family law is the recording of the orders sought and the orders granted um, in terms of to try and get a determination of what actually happened. But the mystery is because it's all behind closed doors. Do, do you mean in terms of, sort of statistics or in an individual case, it's hard to find out what exactly happened? Well, I, yeah, for example, if you're not present in court for the individual case, it's very hard even to get an idea from the file of, of what arguments were presented or what weren't presented or what, for example, comments the judge made. Uh, because people generally wouldn't seek ask, access to the DAR and again, there's an issue about whether, in fact, third parties could get that. Um, so, so, so even an academic researcher, they can sit in the court courtroom, but they can't have access to the yeah, file. Yeah. And if they went to the court office, they would simply be told, no, that's, that's uh, it, privileged. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think there's been quite a bit of contention over that. But I mean, in a general sense, there's a, a, quite a mystery even among lawyers about what happens in the family courts because so little is reported. Again, the circuit family court is currently not a court of record. All the judgments really issue from the High Court. So the High Court uh, only deals with cases where there's um, uh, a minimum of assets of three million. So your normal everyday case doesn't get reported from the Circuit Court. 
What we saw during COVID, though, there was quite a lot of reporting of domestic violence sure. in the district court, uh, where you had um, members of the press who were pre- there, present. Those be criminal cases, would they? Or no, no, that would be family law cases. And... Yeah, exactly. And again, mm. domestic violence increased, but the reporting of domestic violence, I'd never seen anything like the level of it that happened during COVID. There was a huge amount of interest from the media in reporting on domestic violence because it was obviously a big concern during COVID. Mm. And um, in terms of the, the 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 lack of reporting, I mean, that was something that was complained of quite a few years ago by sort of fathers' rights groups and that kind of thing. They'd say, you know, effectively that they were kind of s- sold up by a judge without any journalists present and that kind of thing. Um, do, do you think that, I mean, w- would small changes like allowing journalists or academics see the, the court files make, make a big difference in terms of the reporting? Well, I, I, one of the problems with journalists and with academics at the minute is the resourcing. We can see even from the, the, the number of reporters who are now down in the four courts, mm-hmm. never mind the family courts. I mean, it's a big financial commitment to come to the family courts and to report. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the use of stringers seems to have increased hugely in the, in the four courts compared to having each publication having its own independent person. So quite often, you know, the the journalism is shared to a greater degree. So I think even if there was more availability, the the difficulty is the interest in it. And I think the media doesn't have the money, in fact. Yeah, I think so, because Mm. it's quite labour intensive to sit in a court or Mm. to be there. And again, the courts don't always sit on time in terms of if there's a genuine emergency application, that will obviously jump ahead of things. That may be one that the media are interested in or not. So I think... I think part of it is that um, I don't. I'm not in favour of opening up the in-camera rule. I think there's a good reason sure. that when you when you have something as personal as as either domestic violence, whether it's alleged against you or you're the victim of it, or whether it's separation and divorce, I, I think marital assets, custody of children. I mean, these it, are really things that the public shouldn't know about it, an individual family. And, and, and also, children themselves yeah. shouldn't be able to read about mm. what happened in their parents' case. Mm. And I think that's really probably the main one of the main reasons for it, as well as the historical reasons for it. But again, Mm. that's not the way in the UK and England and Wales. Mm. You know, many other jurisdictions don't have this in camera rule. I I don't think that certainly most family lawyers would be in favour of it being lifted to any significant extent. Certainly, I remember years ago watching both the Paul McCartney divorce and the Britney Spears custody battles being played out in the media and thinking that actually it was a good thing that Ireland had an in camera rule, that we, we just didn't get to hear about those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. But I suppose the flip side is there's a lack of understanding of what happens in the courts. There is a lack of scrutiny, which I think we all need, whatever kind of practice that we're in. But we have changes now. I suppose the judges are now under scrutiny with with, with the changes in the law. Uh, we've got the LSRA, so we have a genuinely, truly independent uh, body that's looking for complaints at, at barristers and solicitors. So, I mean, there has been a lot of other types of accountability sure. Uh, if you like. But in terms of one of the biggest areas of misunderstanding from the public is a common law husband or wife, which isn't isn't a term known in law, yeah. and what are cohabitants' rights? And this yeah. is a relatively new area of law in that it's only about 12 years that cohabitants have rights as against each other as opposed to uh, mm. involving the children. So it, it really is, I think, to get more knowledge mm. out there uh, to people, to the potential litigants or those who have rights so they can... Mm they can understand them and they can come in and enforce them uh, in the course, sure. which is what, what it's all about. Can I take you back a bit just to, to to the beginning of your career? Have you have you practiced in family law throughout your career as a solicitor or was it something that you sort of fell into uh, along the way? Well, I was very lucky in that um, when I was looking for an apprenticeship back in the late 90s, there, there weren't a huge number of apprenticeships and um, I, I finished my LLB in 95 from from Galway and I went to England to work. I had a friend of mine who worked in, in recruitment and he said, come over and I'll get you a job and you'll learn a few quid. It'll be great. And so I went to London for, for two years and worked there. It was a fantastic experience just to get away from, from looking for an apprenticeship and to kind of broaden your horizons. And I did a bit of teaching there and I thought, well, I might might go into teaching because I'd, I'd done a BCom LLB to, to get my degree as you could in, in Galway at the time. I came back, I did the HDIP in, in UCD. I I was lucky to get into it. It was kind of sought after for some reason at the time and uh, I was delighted to do it and I did it in St. Paul's um, Secondary School which is known as the Brunner uh, beside Blackhall Place uh, coincidentally. And I was there about, I'd say, probably a day or two when I realised this was definitely not the career for me. (laughs) 
that. that I wasn't going you to make it. for teach and keep. I, I, I definitely wasn't able for it, but I, I stuck it out for the year and I finished it and I, I passed and got my diploma and I was, was delighted. But while I was doing that, I, it, there's nothing like doing the wrong thing to make it realise what the right thing is. So while I was doing that, I um, applied for a load of legal jobs, but Incredibly, there was a huge change between 1995 and 97 in Ireland. It was just an uplift. So there was quite a lot of traineeships available uh, in 97, 98 that simply weren't around in 94 and 95 when I'd previously been looking. So I had a good idea once I started to look again that, look, it, I, it will happen fairly soon and it's a, it's a question of getting it. And is it a coincidence that that's when the family law legislation came in? Obviously, the divorce was introduced, uh, uh, I think, in 1995, Yeah, 1996. And yeah, the Family Law Act was 95. I mean, would that have made a difference to, to that kind of work being uh, available? I, well, I think there was just a general upsurge in the economy and certainly there would have been a lot more conveyancing work, which would be the mainstay of yeah. kind of general practitioners. But um, so I suppose what I did was I was looking for a, a traineeship, but I also was looking for a law clerk or other legal jobs that would get me a bit of legal experience. And I was very lucky that a law clerk job came up in the legal aid board, uh, a temporary law clerk a job for, I think, three months. So I applied for that and I got it at Newbridge and I worked for Verona Lamb, uh, who's a fantastic person to work for. And then my contract was extended on, for nine months at the legal aid board. And that's obviously exclusively family law offered me a, a traineeship and I at that point I I thought I need to get a bit broader experience so um, I was looking for a, another apprenticeship which again there were plenty out there so I, I, I started off doing legal aid sorry doing family law exclusively for nine months with the legal aid board who really primarily do um, family law and then my master um, Anthony Harris was looking for a family law person and he had a reasonably big family law practice and he got involved in all the George Redmond litigation so he needed a trainee and I came in and did civil litigation and that and then a very broad general practice experience which I think whatever you do and if you want to specialise get in a broad brace so you can see what else is out there and then I suppose I was interested in employment law was where I was thinking about going actually after having done family and general litigation and I finished my traineeship and did another year and then got a job with Carl Fawcett who was an employment law specialist and she had a great amount of trade union work. So there's kind of a, a, a good difference between the kind of skills involved in all of those things. And I and, and that was great. So I did did a couple of years there and then worked for another solicitor and then went back into practice with Anthony doing really general kind of practice, civil litigation. I did conveyancing and probate and kind of a mixed bag. And then I kind of concentrated on civil litigation and then I, I went back uh, probably about 12 or 14 years ago, I said, I'll do as much family as I can and kind of did all of that. And was that because you found it interesting or b because that was where the, to, to put it bluntly, where the business was? Uh, no, it was probably because I found it interesting. And I think because I started off in the legal aid mm. board, what had happened was I saw litigation through the prism of family law yeah. as opposed to family law through the prism of litigation. Because certainly, know. I, I know a lot of us, when we look at family law, you, you know, you come out at the end of the case and really feel there's no winners here. I mean, it's it's quite a... It's it's quite a depressing experience for a lot of people who maybe maybe you get used to it or maybe you see a more positive side of it to it. Well, I, I suppose I would see a more positive side to it because I think when you meet people, particularly not at the end of the case, but maybe a year or two later, hmm. and this litigation and, and these whole issues have been a blockage in their lives. And once they're cleared, they go back to being kind of who they were before all the difficulties. And certainly when I started doing family law, there was a huge social stigma attached to being separated sure. and divorced. And thankfully, that's one of the real positives. That's just disappeared. People aren't worried about people seeing you come into the office or being yeah. seen outside Dolphin House or, or wherever, you know. Keith, can I come in there? Um, I'm, I don't do family law. I was in one family case ever in my life. Uh, and it's a very challenging area of law. And while all law, you know, has aggrieved parties and there's always a lot of emotion involved in, in legal cases, you come out of the high court and you see the side that has lost or the side that has won, there's elation or disappointment. I always think that family law is more endowed with emotion than, than most other branches. So often when you're representing clients, there's an element of being part counsellor as well, isn't there? I mean, you're talking people through difficult situations as well as giving strict legal representation. Yeah, there there is a small element to that, but I think you okay. you, you the, the real thing the the trick for family lawyers is tr not to over identify with the clients either. While being empathetic and fair and reasonable, you are still a solicitor, 
and there is a role for a counsellor but you're not the counsellor but you have to be a reasonable human being and empathetic as well and I, I you take that as a given but I mean I think the problem sometimes is if if, if you're dealing with a, an, another colleague or, or someone who believes all their geese are swans that nobody is perfect and no client is perfect so you, you, you do your best obviously for them but I think having some element of distance in the long run with your client is really important in family law. And um, okay, okay, yeah. that's that's very interesting. Now, from a distance, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought, of course, you have to be professional and have a distance. Yeah. But that you know, you would be getting the phone calls. You could get phone calls yeah. late at night, difficult situations. You talked about COVID, the massive increase in domestic violence, for example. And yeah, people need need representation from people like you. Yeah, and I, I mean, particularly during COVID because um, uh, Safe Ireland did this um, survey a number of years ago, which led, I think, fairly directly to the Domestic Violence Act being changed. But their slogan was, when the, when, the, when the house, when the family home is not a safe place. And I think really some family homes during COVID were very unsafe. So you had a lot of people kind of ringing about domestic violence, getting advice about domestic violence, but at, at least accessing justice and being able to access the courts. And Colin Daly and his, his predecessor or his successor were very good at keeping in the family district court open, particularly in Dublin. But one yes. of the challenges for the district court is they, they are the court of local jurisdiction. It's really important to have local courts uh, and to have them open, not just for domestic violence, but for, for a lot of other cases as well. So, um, But I, I think you, you have to be able to park your day's work when you leave. You have to have your client but you also have your colleague and you have the court. And again, our solicitor and, and, and barrister, our first loyalty and priority is to the court to ensure that we, we represent our clients to the best of our ability. But that there has to be a line as well and we have to go home and, and be able to forget that's about it and have your cup of tea. And no, no, absolutely. Whatever, without being, and, and, and that's in no way to diminish the importance of what you're doing for the client, but, but also you can't survive Yes, if you're, if you're right. emotionally involved in all of that sort yeah. of stuff. Now, famously, your 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 place of business is in Crumlin, and it's you're expanding all the time. I know there's been various different yeah. uh, additions to your to your practice. You've taken on some uh, some well known yeah, family yeah, lawyers. Yeah, so Aidan Reynolds, who was, yes, was from Gallagher Shatter, Gallagher Shatter yeah, with famous Anna Shatter, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and they're no more. Unfortunately, the, the practice ended uh, earlier this year. So, um, I know Aidan. I would have dealt with him an awful lot. So I was delighted that he. He he came on board and he's a partner now and his colleague Monica okay, as well. Wonderful. So it's great. So it's um, so tell me tell me about your practice. So if you were to is is it mainly divorce separation type scenarios? Is it domestic violence? What so what are the percentages of, of work that you guys I, do? I would say probably in the main, um, both Aidan and myself who do all the family law would do between us probably I would say over ninety percent of uh, judicial separation divorce. So that would be mainly dealing with children in the context of of marital breakdown or cohabitation, also dealing with the finances. There, That's the main bit. The domestic violence is much less so uh, front and centre um, uh, in terms of, of the types of cases that we would deal with. We deal probably more with the bigger money cases, which are the high court, and also with the um, judicial separation and divorce in the circuit court, and then some domestic violence in the district court, okay. um, and also cohabitant cases as well. We've done child abduction um, uh, kind of family-related probate as well. But that would be it in the main. Okay, and for people who wouldn't really know what's involved, could you talk us through the process, judicial separation to divorce? What sort of time period is involved? How, how does it start and how does it progress? So what it normally starts with in terms of people will ring my office and say, um, can I have a chat? I'd be recommended or I, I found out about you this way. And... Um, I, I'll have a chat with them on the phone to see is the type of case that I do. And if it is, they come in, they sit down or they, they have a Zoom. But much more no, no, post-COVID people want to sit down with you. So you sit down for an hour, you find out what's happened, how they ended up there. And the most important question I suppose I have to ask them is, is it over? Do you believe it's over or not? And if it's not over, well, then there's a whole range of other things they should do, like okay. conciliation and marriage guidance and, and all sorts of things. So you're not rushing anyone, uh, that they, they make sure that they're happy. So that's the first question. Well, it's not the first question, but at the end of it, it's sometimes up the, it, up near the, it's, the, it's there. But also sometimes it's obvious that the person, it isn't over from their mm. point of view. And again, I would quite often offer counselling in terms of say to people that they may need to talk to a counsellor to work that element of it out. And it's even worse, I suppose, when they come in with the the, the, the pleadings haven't been served on them. So it's clearly the other party, the yeah. spouse has decided it's over. And when you ask them if it's over, 
it, it's less important, if you like, as if one of two people decide a marriage is over, it's over, unfortunately. So, th- so that would be it. And then you, you kind of, I'd go through the suite of options, which would be um, mediation, potentially collaborative law, uh, lawyer-assisted resolution, uh, pleadings and court. Okay. And, and, and where does court fit into it? Now, court really in family law is a means to get people to the table. You're, yes. you're not going to court because you want the, the judge to determine it. In all family law cases, the, the litigants or the parties, the husband or wife, should be able to resolve it in a much better and more tailored way than a judge could ever do it. And, and that's really what, what you're saying. Um, so, so before you get to court, there is the mediation option, isn't there? Oh, yeah. And is that being used? Is that being utilised? Can people sort of put their grief behind them and come in and try and say, look, we need to sort this out, so let's try and do it in the most efficient way possible? Yeah, and, and mediation is really important. There, there are a few areas it's, it's not appropriate. If there's any domestic violence at all, um, the difficulty with mediation is the two people have to be in the same room at the same time. And so mediation works also where there's a very different, we'll say, power imbalance between the parties, mediation might work. But I mean, mediation can be used for an awful lot of cases, but both parties have to want to do it. So the voluntariness is really important in mediation, um, provided it's appropriate in the circumstances. But that has to be, that's always part of the discussion, unless the other person has already issued the proceedings. But again, mediation can come at any time. Um, and also collaborative law, which, you know, in, involves lawyers and is... is is another way of doing it. Um, I, I know the Bar Council, the Law Society, are looking at trying to introduce arbitration to deal with discrete issues yes. so that you might, mm. for example, in a mediation, you might agree everything except, for example, access and custody and the division of the pension. And you might be able to arbitrate those two points if there's an agreement on it. But obviously there are bigger issues because in Ireland, either a divorce or a judicial separation, there has to be proper provision at the end and a judge is the only person who can, can decide Can I ask that. you about that? Because in Ireland, the, the way that both the 95 and 96 mm. Acts work, proper provision gives very broad discretion to a judge in relation to lump sum payments, maintenance, that kind of thing, to the extent that I imagine if you ran the same case in front of three or four different judges, you might get three or four relatively different results. Whereas a lot of other countries, I think they effectively have a formula. I know that uh, various American states do, and I know in Germany they have effectively formulas to say, this is how the marital assets should be divided up. Now, maybe that's too strict, but does it mean that far too many cases don't get resolved early enough, effectively, until you 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 find out who your judge is? Is there a risk of form, forum shopping in, uh, in family I, law? I, I, I think if if you get reasonably experienced family lawyers at relatively early on in the process, you can give your client a good idea of what the range is, yeah. what a good and a bad and a very good outcome is in a lot of cases. I don't think that changes hugely between judges. Mm-hmm. So I think someone with a bit of experience would be able to do that for a client so that the client knows what the range of what to expect is. And I think once the client knows the range, it can be settled. Um, mm-hmm. I think some of the difficulties that, that I'm in, countering in cases that I think should be settled but aren't settled are where you may have a slight complexity, for example, um, uh, and it's a very positive complexity, is the big pharma or tech companies uh, operate share vesting schemes. And the, these have introduced a huge amount of wealth to Ireland in terms of for employees so that they the people get vested in shares. And that mm. just needs a little bit of unpicking and a bit of financial assistance to do it. And then you have to work out, well, how does that feature in the rest of the case. But I mean, a lot of cases are relatively straightforward in that there's one house, there's children, there's probably two salaries, unfortunately, because of the way the housing market's gone. Mm. Um, And there may be childcare and Mm. there may be other debt and there may be savings. And again, those kinds of cases you would hope aren't that different. And and what about cases where, for example, one party has had an inheritance? I mean, you you know, if if, if, if somebody inherits a, a house in a Dublin suburb these days, it must make quite a difference to the overall marital assets. And does the does the other spouse then um, have the benefit of that? Well, it, it, it depends on the situation. And it also depends the timing of the inheritance. So, for example, if, if it happened relatively early on in the marriage and the money has gone into things... Uh, it's it's very difficult to trace it back. Once it's gone, it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone, exactly. And, and that's one of the difficulties. Yeah. And, th- and that would be similar for, for other things like, for example, a personal injuries claim yeah. that one of the parties might have had or um, we say a redundancy or, have, or something like that. Have you ever had to sell the family farm? No. 
no, I mean, we're it. talking emotion <laughs> here now. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no. And I mean, the, the whole, the, the nature of the family farm featured so much in the 96 referendum. Sure. If you remember that, you know, people were taking I'm thinking of the Bull hooks. McCabe and Richard and, Harris and, and, and you know, no, the field. Don't the, take it away no, from me, Keith. No, I, thankfully, I, I haven't seen seen that, that many family farms. And, and again, there's usually a creative enough way to deal with the with the wealth. The problem you is you are working crumb limit now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we wouldn't. We we don't have a lot of Wicklow farmers now. <laughs> um, uh, but it is. I, I suppose it it depends really in terms of the inheritance. But if the inheritance particularly happens post separation or later on, it's much less likely to be taken into account. And an awful lot of people are worried prior to the person dying. So in a lot of cases, there is no inheritance as yet. Um, so. So, but generally, inheritance wouldn't be counted as part of the pot um, on, on, unless it was quite historic. And and one of obviously one of the big changes in in marriage in the last few years is that now there are same sex couples who are marrying, and um, and I imagine even in these early days there are same sex uh, marriages that are are breaking up. Are, are there do different issues arise in relation to those, or is that is that a well, I, I mean, I suppose what I've found in a, a number of the same-sex divorces I've done and some of the civil partnership dissolutions as well um, is that there's a more money involved in, and sometimes there's children and sometimes there aren't, but um, they, they certainly, same-sex couples seem to have generated a lot more wealth. So you've uh, maybe more wealth-related issues in terms of unpicking financial information and um, who's contributed to that. And also, I mean, one of the big factors in any marriage is the length of time people are married. So mm. I suppose we haven't seen very long marriages as yet because of the, the, the yes, um, the uh, marriage equality is only relatively recently. So we, we need to see probably a couple of long marriages where there's been a lot of interdependence and, and kind of joint enterprise, if you like, in, in terms of things. So um, I suppose that's our, our difficulty with that. But I, I mean, we, we will see much more because, again, everyone who gets married, there's a percentage of divorce. And I suppose in a feature that is probably unusual to Ireland is the length of time you need to be separated before you get divorced. Yes. And at the moment, I think it's four out of the previous five years to allow for some level of a reconciliation possibility. Well, it, it, that's um, the original one. But Josepha Madigan, I think, brought a private members bill, which was then got cross-party support. So I think from the 1st of January 2019, it was reduced then uh, from two out of the last three years. But um, th the, that's a no-fault divorce that we have. Um, but the difficulty is if you have fault, uh, you can't access that for any reason. So, for example, if uh, uh, if there's adultery or if there's domestic violence or, or other issues, you, you know, the two years is an absolute. So what you do is you access uh, judicial separation. So in order, to, the, the no-fault basis for judicial separation is living one year apart, uh, but there are also fault-based grounds. So adultery uh, behaving in such a way that it wouldn't be reasonable to expect your partner to continue to, to live with you, that's another one. So you, you can get judicially separated by the courts um, if you're living separately and apart for, for that period, but uh, for, 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 if they're for on fault grounds. But just to say that that's really important because if you can't if you can't access judicial separation you can't access the suite of ancillary orders such as a freezing sure. order um and other things so i think judicial separation isn't going to disappear uh, mm. but it's going to be less and less frequent and what happens quite often uh with with my clients is you'll start a judicial separation but then you'll be sooner or later you'll be within sight of the two two years and you can turn sure. it into a divorce if it continues off on but if you settle a judicial separation you get the divorce done as quickly as you can. So you can, okay. it's not... Keith, can I bring you back to something you said earlier? You talked about maybe, uh, you know, with the Law Society and the Bar Council trying to develop an ancillary service, an arbitration service to deal with sticking points. Yeah. And you identified two. You talked about pension entitlements, etc. And I can understand why that would be significant yeah. and could potentially be a sticking point. The other one you mentioned was custody and access, which is a huge thing. Yeah. Okay. And custody and access over the years, I mean, have you seen a change in that... Uh, Mark made the point there earlier that because family law is not, is in camera and we don't see what's going on, there's a perception men, that men maybe are treated unfairly within the context of family law. Would you say that's your experience? Yeah, well, I suppose I started in the in the mid to late 90s when things were very different and there were much m more different views in, in relation to custody access and how men, 
excuse me, how fathers should behave and how mothers should behave. And it has changed fundamentally in terms of uh, what a father's role is expected to be. So I think de- definitely society has changed and the courts have slowly caught up. Um, uh, I do think certainly in the late 90s, it was my experience that it was more difficult for a father to get more access than, you know, a couple of hours during the week and every second weekend. But that has slowly changed uh, yes. to uh, maybe uh, th- th- there's some concept of joint uh, if you like, 50-50 uh, custody. But that's still quite rare in the courts. Um, the difficulty is really for the children if 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 they need some one base to live in. And also currently one of the huge problems is is housing need for a, for a dad. And again, remember at the end of a separate judicial separation or divorce, one of the two spouses will not be in the house. So you're moving from a one house uh, sure. family to two yes. houses. So there's going to be whole so issues. So the accommodation crisis is obviously very real. It, it's yeah, a, and course. it's a real problem for the, the end of the marriage. But no, I think fathers have certainly, I, in my experience, they've been treated better uh, and better. I think it was important to have the men's groups who are lobbying there and saying, look, this is important and access, to, you know, the dads who want access to the justice uh, need to get it. What, what's happened, I suppose, as well as you've had the, the, the children's, the referendum in 2015 and the voice of the child now being heard and also um, the welfare reports as well, looking at, at at what's best for the children. So from that point of view, there's been much more of an openness and we've brought experts in who weren't there before. Very good. And more yeah. factors have been taken into and account. More, exactly. But also okay. I think dads are standing up more and, yes. and saying, look, that isn't good enough. I live with my children now. When this finishes, I want to see them so often. And, and quite often, you know, if, if you're creative and you look at maybe picking kids up from... from activities and doing other stuff but but dads want the time yes, with their true. kids so but you I said joint custody is still very rare uh, no sorry um uh, 50-50 uh, custody where yes. you share it 100% but joint custody is a standard order in every single d- okay. divorce or separation okay. it would be primary care and control still goes to the mother an awful lot sure. of the time and again the, the, I haven't had a huge amount of 50-50 custody cases but almost most of the ones I've done it was an operation before the people came to me because they could operate it because one of the problems in the contentious access custody issues are handovers and yes. children seeing parents fighting and uh, difficulties where one of the parents isn't maybe um, assisting the other parent with, um, you know, encouraging access or other things. Yes. Okay. And yeah. It's very difficult to know, is it the parent or is it the children or is it the other parent? So, so those kind of situations are very, very mm. tricky and can cause a huge amount of litigation and a huge amount of... Uh, of court time uh, as well. So, and can, the, can I talk about access in, in other ways? Um, legal aid. And as you yeah. said, when you started, you started doing a lot of legal aid. Yeah. And I presume you still do legal aid, uh, Keith. I, no, I've, Less I've, so. I've, I've almost completely stopped doing it. I have okay. the odd case. But I'm involved, I suppose, with the Law Society Family Law Committee looking at legal aid and how important it is yes. in the system because mo- a huge number of the family law cases are legally aided. Yes. I think about a third of them. Dolphin probably. House. Exactly. And and the private practitioner scheme is so important too. And it is hard. I mean, practitioners who work in, on legal aid, they need private clients as well, don't they? They need cl- clients who can pay as well to basically to fund the operation. It, it, it's yeah. not sufficient. The legal aid isn't good enough. Sure, it's not. No, it isn't. And I think even John McDade, who's the CEO of the Legal Aid Board in the last report of the Legal Aid Board, which came out a couple of weeks ago, he said that, look, the, the, the money isn't sufficient at all. And he, he was very thankful. But for private practitioners but essentially the private practitioners who do operate the private practitioner scheme which is the scheme where you go to any solicitor who's on the on the on the private practitioner scheme and you can access it and they get a certificate from the legal aid board that they're essentially funding the mm. service because they're doing it at an undervalue and again yes. in 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 access custody disputes you used to be able to go in and when I was doing them in the district court 15 or 20 years ago you used to be going and do them on the return date and they'd be done. Now, everything takes two or three goes because if you do have a report, you know, you have to get the assessor, you have to get the report and you have to go back in and between everything, there's three or four. And, and uh, there is now a shortage of solicitors on the legal aid panels. There. The, well, there, the, there's a difficulty in getting solicitors to fill it. And so what happens is as a client, you get your cert for a private practitioner and you get a, a list of solicitors who are on the panel. And the difficulty is getting solicitors who are willing to take the case on sure. or who might be available. So there's an access to justice issue there uh, for people. Now, that, that's particularly true in access and custody, not as 
true in domestic violence. And it, and it is a particular problem because people going into any family law proceedings are likely to be quite vulnerable. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not going to be in the, uh, necessarily in the, the, able to fight the case themselves. Essentially, with, without a bit of assistance. No, and the, and they need it. And I mean, the equality of arms would demand demand sure. that both people mm. have have access to it. And again, what's happened is the legal aid board have almost completely contracted out the district court element to private practitioners. So there is an argument for saying, well, would the legal aid board take it back and operate it as um, as a legal aid board? a hundred percent scheme where they would have people who were down there because there is a kind of a there, there's a kind of a, a um, economy of scale that if you're in the district court all day yeah. you can do quite a number of cases and it's not as big a yeah. thing to get adjourned but the amount of resources that would cost the legal aid board I'd say be too significant and I think mm. it may suit everyone the private practitioner scheme is underfunded but but, the, but it, there, there is a recognition at this stage, though, that there is a lack of funding, isn't there? There is a recognition by the Legal Aid Board. And again, the Legal Aid Board, I understand, have gone to government and the Law Society and the Bar Council have lobbied government, but there's been no uplift in it. Sure. Well, hopefully we can do our bit. On the fifth well, court, exactly. we want more legal aid. No, it's very, very important. No, it is. And it's okay. not fair. People are going in working very hard and giving yeah. great representation mm-hmm. and they're not being properly remunerated. It's, right. it's wrong. Keith, this has been absolutely brilliant. We've, we've, it's been so comprehensive. You've covered everything under the sun, but there's one thing you still have to cover. And Mark has the question. Do you have a book or film you'd like to re- recommend to any lawyers or law students who might be listening to The Fifth Court? I do. I, I had a good think about uh, the book and uh, to, to try and figure it out. And I initially was going to go with The Verdict, which is, is a Barry Reid book, which was made into a fantastic film with uh, Paul Newman, which is fantastic for litigators and the, the perils of the expert witness letting you down at the last minute and difficulties with discovery and everything. But I thought I instead of that, which I highly recommend, I thought, well, look, the best legal book I've probably read is the Rule and McCormack one, uh, the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. I thought fantastic it was fantastic. Book. The new yeah. editor of the Irish Times. Indeed. There you go. Yeah. 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 So I thought mm. maybe because of that, I said I'd recommend that because it explains so much, not just about the law, but about the personalities that shape that court. And about the country. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us on The Fifth Court. Thanks very much. The Fifth Court is adjourned until next week. Okay, so that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to our guest, family law solicitor Keith Walsh, who came into us today, and we really enjoyed talking to him. I would also like to say a big thank you to our producer, Cunnell O'Moroin, and to the Dublin South Podcast Studios for recording this show and doing such a wonderful job. If you have any comments or any legal stories you would like to raise with us, please contact us on our website or on LinkedIn. And Mark, as I said, we're delighted that we're getting a little bit of, you know, getting a little bit Absolutely. of attention out there attention, and yeah. on the yeah. charts and all that sort of stuff. But again, we're, we're hoping to build our audience well, and we'd like our listeners to, to, to share again. to say that law is the new rock and roll. So. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe the new country and western. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> very good, very good. I don't think we'd make a boy band anyway, but anyway, that's, that's all right. Okay, so that's all from this edition of the show. So from myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Tottenham, Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. Until the next time, goodbye.